We give people all these mantras about resilience and mindfulness, and these are powerful terms. What we, we tell people, just do it. But what we don't do is give them tools to access these states more readily. And for people that are lucky enough to have the time or come into contact with people that help guide them down a path, like they get some crucible experience early in life where they go, wow, I felt like I was very close to death or close to panic and I recovered myself. It's powerful, but you don't want people putting themselves into harm's way in order to achieve these things. And it's really quite simple. We don't, in this culture, we do not teach people how to operate their mind and body. And, and it leads to all sorts of problems, stress, anxiety disorders, ADD. It's a huge problem. And I think that the brain is harder to you know, identify like a user's manual, right? Because it's always meditation, consciousness, high level concepts, what do dreams mean? But I like that we're starting with physiology because what's nice about these core mechanisms of brain body is that they are real things. Like if we could point to the neurons, these are things in the textbooks. Once you know how to do it, it works the first time, it works every time. So I think that one of the most important questions that we should all ask ourselves anytime we want to learn or we want to relax or we want to sleep is ask ourselves, you know, where are we on this continuum of alertness and sleep? As a culture, we've spent a lot of time thinking about kind of the core things like get a good night's sleep. Because obviously the way I think about sleep and rest is when you're not getting enough or and it's different from everybody for everybody, but if you're not getting enough sleep on a regular basis or you're just too stressed out. It's like the hinge on that seesaw is loose. So it's like yeah. you're up, you're down, you're all over the place. And so there's some foundational practices of sleep, hydration, exercise, social connection, good nutrition, whatever that means for, for the individual that put you in a place to be able to manage things really well. But what we've been talking about up until now are these, what I call real-time tools. You know, I love the ice bath. I've done Tumo breathing. I still do it. I really believe it in its virtues. There's some good science about how it helps activate the immune system, all these other great things. But the ability to adjust in real time is what it's about. Because that's, I think, where real confidence comes from. Like mm -hmm. you do a lot of public speaking. I do a lot of public speaking. And there's still days where I'll show up and I'm you know, all of a sudden, like I'll feel my cheeks getting flush. I'm like, what's going on? I have to be able to adjust in real time. Yep. It's not sufficient to be like, oh, you know, I'm going to go meditate for an hour. Or what did I do wrong the day before? And this is what it's, it's is a lot like driving a car. Everyone should know how to manage their internal real estate, their mind and their body with do, do's and don'ts of physical practices of just, you know, practices with that don't involve ingesting anything. It also puts you in a position to better navigate those extreme states, right? I mean, the person who decides to dabble with nicotine, like not by smoking, but taking nicotine for focus, if you can't handle and manage your mind in a very alert state, it's just gonna make things worse. Mm. You'll think that you're in a, in a tunnel of focus, but you actually are in a tunnel of high stress and nothing good comes out of that. Whereas if you've already mastered what it is to be really alert and focused, and you want to take that to the next level and you're an adult and it's you know appropriate for you and your health status then you're going to get that much more out of it and whereas i think a lot of people look first to like what's the thing i can take it's like well the thing you can take is master your sleep wake cycle master your moment to moment kind of autonomic regulation this calm down get more alert and do it with some breathing or if you like the ice bath do that or if you want to you know, run up a steep hill and then see how quickly you can calm yourself down using double inhale, exhale type sign. That's cool. There's a huge play space that you don't need to take anything. And then once you feel like you're working well there, well then sure, maybe it's appropriate to go down the avenue of, you know, supplementation or other. When people are confronted with an anxiety provoking scenario, in our case, we do this with virtual reality because we need to do it in the laboratory. We find that we find their pain point essentially. And by pain point, I don't mean extreme fear. I mean, the thing that can raise their autonomic arousal that has them in a mode of considering different options and trying to figure out what is strategic and what they're capable of in that moment. Could be heights, could be confrontation with a predator, animal. It varies by person, the people, but everyone has their pain point, even, uh, even Navy SEALs that we brought to the laboratory or other people from the special operations community, they all, each and everyone has their pain point. What they do in response to that pain point is really what's interesting. And what we found was that the pause or freeze response certainly was associated with autonomic arousal, with stress and anxiety. We measure this in the brain and body. 
And then we found that there were a subset of individuals and animals in the parallel animal work that would confront a fear, not necessarily reflexively, but after some consideration, they would lean into the challenge, essentially confront the thing that was making them feel anxious. And it turned out that that response, surprisingly, was associated with the highest levels of autonomic arousal. There, the insula took on essentially a, a, a change in its activity patterns, this gamma pattern. The heart rate increased, breathing increased, sweating increased. So these are all the marks of an anxiety attack. But here, if you were to just look at the behavior of the person or the animal, what you'd find is that they were marching forward toward their fear. One reason to suppress the somatic response, the bodily response, is that tends to be a unitary interpretation, meaning at this moment, I feel alert, but calm. So I feel good, but I'm guessing there's a lot of signals coming from the body. And in fact, there are to my brain, but I tend to just say, I feel pretty good. In fact, I'm very delighted to be here. So I feel good. Or if I'm very tired, I feel tired. Those tend to be very kind of um, binned responses and they're fairly generic. You know, I, I guess we can look to some of our podcasting colleagues like the the Jocko Willinks or the, the David Goggins, you know, who are either forcing themselves uh, or are somehow up at 4.30 in the morning and train pushing through that, what I call limbic friction. You know, the limbic system is saying I'm tired or I'm anxious and you know, going against that. So there's, there's literally a, a, there, there's a required suppression of the bodily response in order to imagine how we would feel when we complete this. If we want to be very concrete, we should probably focus on actions. And I'll mm-hmm. use fitness as an example because it translates to everybody, whereas you know, people's circumstances sure. differ. Let's say somebody really wants to take on a fitness routine they hate running or they want to lose weight in a, in a healthy way, this kind of thing. So we've all heard the example, well, you put your shoes by the door on day one, day two, you put them on day three, you go out the door, day four, you walk around the block and then, you know, and then eventually like they're running marathons. Okay, <laughs> great. But to sustain that behavior or even to make the, the behavior pleasurable and to give you energy, the key is to subjectively reward those steps. So it's not going to be, mm. let's say I go out and I run a mile. And my goal is to run 10 miles in a few weeks. The key is as you're in the strain of that mile, the hard part, you want to tell yourself, this is the good part. This is the part that gives me energy. And I'll be very surprised if people don't actually feel like they could continue further. So it's a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single, is made up of, you know, single steps. But the key is to reward the harder steps, not the easier ones and not the ones where you get the thing that you want. Find the wall and push a little bit further through that wall and reward that process. Um, In fact, I'm not telling people to do anything. I'm just saying that there's, our biology is primarily for taking us through these adventures of arousal and relaxation. Waking up in the morning is an exercise in, in autonomic arousal. Cortisol hits when you wake up, boom. Can you do that without losing your mind and thought? And obsession. Yeah. Can you l- put your head down at night and fall asleep without losing your mind in the previous day's events? These are skills that we have to cultivate.